So I would like to welcome everyone. Today we are talking Go for the Gold in PT private practice. And we have some very highly respected gold medal clients that we are featuring today. And this by no means is to say that we don't have a lot of gold member clients in Meg Academy, but we chose them to represent some different respective categories. So representing the mobile, mobile practice, we have Mr. Michael Gorman. Um, and I joked earlier, I'm not going to try and express all the credentials that you have after your name, but this is a very intelligent person that we Half have uh, on our team right here. And then we have Mr. Jordan Zuccarelli, who's going to represent our startup practice. And then Mr. Yoni Raz Rosenblatt, who is going to represent our existing expanding practices. Of course, we have Brian Gallagher, who is the founder of MEG, and I am Nicole Walzak, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of MEG and the Chief Developer of MEG Academy. So we're going to jump right on in it today. Brian, I'm going to let you do a, a, another introduction here for those after we start a recording, but I think you said it well, like what we want to hear from our gold medal clients today. today. Can you summarize yeah. that? Absolutely. So thank you, everybody. I know time is precious and there's a lot of places you could be and you're choosing to be here with us. And if you're watching this recorded equally as important, I know we have very busy schedules. And so from all of us here at Meg, we're very grateful for your time and we appreciate it. As you all know, we like to keep it light and fun. So we'll keep with our normal theme. I am in Nicole's kitchen right now and she's up in the, in the den somewhere in, in Quebec or something. I don't know. Are you in Ottawa? I'm not sure exactly sure where you are. North. Yeah. So she's right. somewhere up north. Knowing. Um, but what I wanted to share with you is each and every month, Nicole is the producer and developer of these Zoom casts, and we have external where we're open it to the, all the public, such as you yourselves. And then we have specialized internal high level advanced training that we preserve just for our med clients. So we hope to have all of you as med clients and part of our community someday and let you uh, take part in, in, in that training. Um, we try to make that as cutting edge as advanced as possible. For instance, uh, we are looking at innovative technologies to advance all of our clients. But for here and today, we have a diverse panel, as you have heard from Nicole. And what we're trying to do is, um, I must say, over the last 20 years of helping owners succeed in private practice, which we have two purposes, have physical therapists live the life that they've always envisioned for themselves, whether that be an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, or manager, or staff therapist. Really, it's, it's your heart's desire. Um, and number two, help advance the profession of physical therapy. Anywhere, any way we can, we want to advance the profession of physical therapy, whether we're talking at schools, universities, state chapters, or talking directly to you through podcasts, Zoomcasts, and so on. Today, what we're hoping to do, what I'm really hoping out of this uh, forum, is that we pull back the curtain a little bit and let you hear from people who are just like you, because there was a moment in time where they were staff therapists, they were fresh out of school, they were treating patients, just trying to be the best therapist they can, and they got the thought like, huh, my DNA tells me that I am blissfully discontent at what I'm doing right now. I'm not unhappy. I'm happy. But I have this degree of discontent, like I'm engineered or I'm DNA, you know, formulated to do more than what I'm currently doing for this employer. And I often say on my podcast, ask yourself, are you going to be happy with a snapshot of you today? And then me taking a picture of you five years from now, what will have changed? I think from each one of these gentlemen here on our, on our Zoomcast today, their lives have drastically changed from when they were two years out of school to where they are today. And I'm hoping they're going to give you some insight, ideas, and information to, to kind of erase some of the mystery that some of you may have from being a staff therapist to wanting to be a successful owner. These are all very successful owners. So by all means, I have very little to say from this point forward. Over to you guys, let's let it rip and let's sh share some insight to why and how being a practice owner is so, so satisfying to you and what that yeah. means to you. I, I think that's very well said, Brian. And I think that's a good segue to open this up to, let's, let's start with Jordan because you are the most recent uh, startup that, that we're working with, especially on this panel. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what that looked like and what made you make that decision to go from clinician to private practice owner. And, e and even before you talk, Jordan, like yeah. what fears, concerns, considerations might you have had prior to actually doing mm -hmm. it? And then how do you feel about those now? 
Yeah. Okay. So, well, first of all, thank you guys for inviting me to do this. This is awesome to get to be a part of this. Uh, I, I really had been looking at starting a clinic for probably the last three or four years. Uh, I graduated in 2014, had some really fantastic private practice uh, clinical instructors while I was in school and really got to see what a good, successful private practice could be like. But those were in different parts of the country, nowhere near where I was. So I didn't have a, a real local mentor. So for me, I, I really recognized that the, the biggest gap in getting from where I was with my training and knowledge and experience to where I needed to be to be able to run a private practice, I, I needed mentoring. I needed some kind of guidance along the way. And that's eventually what led me, led me to Meg. As far as my, my fears uh, throughout the process and then how that's changed now, uh, I, I would say my, my fears are drastically different. When I started, it was the fear of, you know, are the referrals going to come in? Yeah. Am I going to be able to generate the, the business or are providers going to be willing to send patients to me? And now it's, we are so busy that are we going to start losing business and losing those relationships because there's a delay to get in and see us. So it's, it's kind of flipped from, are we going to be busy enough to, okay, now we're too busy. <laughs> So, so that's the, that, the it's been a, a little bit of a flip. It, it's, it's good. It's a good problem to have. Uh, but that, yeah, that I would say is the, the biggest difference in sort of those, those fears. And then obviously starting up, you know, now I'm, I'm very focused on is the money coming in? We're doing the work. Right. Is the money coming in? And, and how do we make sure we're monitoring how frequently that's happening and, and how efficiently that's happening so that I can, so that I can look my patients and our employees in the face and tell them we're going to be open tomorrow. We're going to be open next month. We, mm -hmm. we are heading in the right direction where we're generating stability for you guys. Yes. It's, it, it's nice to make money, right? That's part of why we go into this. It's nice to, to feel like we're being reimbursed for the things that we're doing. But really for me, from a financial standpoint, it's all about, can I look everyone in the face and say, this is stable enough so you guys can rely on us and count on us to be here tomorrow morning with our doors open. And so that is kind of my, my biggest fear and focus right now. Um, yeah. So Yoni, yeah. You, you're several years down the road hearing Jordan and hearing his, you know, concerns and what, what can you reflect back on when you first opened up? Are, are these similar to some of the concerns you had? What, what could you provide him with in terms of advice or, you know, insight, um, knowing where you're at now? Yeah, uh, Jordan, I was going to jump in and say, I know you're supposed to, you're the startup version, um, <laughs> but that's I deal with that all the time. I mean, I'm eight years into to this uh, journey, and it's it's almost exactly what you said. It's just larger scale. Um, it's yeah. the same thing of making sure we're getting reimbursed and uh, making sure that what do we do if uh, we're too full? I, I don't think that goes away. I know Brian like counsels on that, but it's always like this evolving world of, well, are we really ready for another 40 hours to bring someone on? Can we really fill that? Or do we want to hang tight? And then looking back at, at past trends and saying, we know, you know, college athletes go back to school then, so we can hold on to the staff. We don't need to add, et cetera, and trying to predict. But those, mm -hmm. it, you hope, and it sounds like it is for you, Jordan, it's just getting amplified or, or um, yeah. multiplied as you grow, but it's the same problems. Yeah, but I know when we first met, Yoni, structure yep. <laughs> was a little willy-nilly, right? It wasn't, sure. it wasn't implemented. 
implementing structure has certainly allowed you. And I mean, I just, I know that you've grown tremendously in the last several years, yep. but it's allowed you right to help organize things a bit better. Would you yeah, agree? There, I mean, there's, there's no question about it. I think it's putting a system in place and, and understanding what's worked that's industry specific mm -hmm. um, has been really invaluable. Um, and, and the collaboration and cooperation to say, he, here's kind of the meg plan and here's what true sports looks like. And how do we, how do we merge those um, has been really awesome. Um, so I think that's what you have to look forward to. I think anyone on this call is, you know, I wish I was on this call when I started for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And just to put it in perspective in Nicole, that was really good uh, to this point. Yoni, how many offices do you have and what's your patient volume per week? Would you say just ballpark? Yeah. I mean, today we have 11 offices and 40 physical therapists and they're, they're treating 10 patients a day. So, okay. And then Jordan, what do you have? So we've got two of us now. I hired a, another therapist about three weeks ago and he, he is off for three days this week as part of a pre-existing arrangement before I hired him. Uh, but we're going to be, we'll be somewhere around high fifties to low sixties by the end of the week. We just got some can some snow today. So we'll have a few more mm -hmm. cancellations because of that, but yeah, high fifties, low sixties, yeah. one at a time, one hour appointments. Yep. Yep. So I say that because I want to play the role of the uh, listener, the attendee, the, the person who's watching this, right? And just to, for those of you who are watching this, pretend I'm you and I'm going to ask the questions you would ask, the things that I think are going on in your head. The reason why I just asked those two gentlemen to share what they shared is you can see, as Yoni accurately depicted, whether you have 11 offices or whether you have one office, you are going to come against the same struggles, the same stresses, the same pressures, just mm -hmm. on a different level. Mm -hmm. But as both professionals shared with you, because they're of the highest integrity and the highest ethics in what they're doing, what's forefront in their mind is, oh my goodness, am I doing at all times what's best for the people in my community, my patient public, as well as my raw public, people in my community, Am, am I doing what's best for the people who are entrusting them their, their livelihood by working here with me? I mean, think of Yoni's payroll, right? And that's paying car payments and mortgages and rent and food on the table and insurance. And same thing for Jordan. So I want you guys to realize going through business from day one, when you decide to get into it, I think I really appreciate what Yoni said. And it's very, very kind of him. Uh, and Jordan as well said the same thing. Tiger Woods is a better golfer because he had a coach who pushed his performance beyond what he envisioned he could do. Pushed him to do what the coach could see he was capable of, but he, the coach needed to push him just a bit more out of his comfort level and give him the foundational structure to stand on so that he could perform at that higher level. That's what we're trying to do. That's how we see our job with you guys. And both of you like explain that and that and that nature. So as you're watching this and you're listening and you're an owner and you're thinking to myself, it's, it's like, it's like your normal body. You feel good today. Nicole's feeling great. She ate lunch. She's good. But I'm telling you, after Thanksgiving, she's overdone it. She's uncomfortable. She's a little uncomfortable. And then, and then in New Year's, she's dieting. Now she's miserable, man. She's dieting. So businesses go through this. I'm a little uncomfortable. Like Jordan saying, a little uncomfortable. And then all of a sudden, as Yoni, Yoni said, I hired two or three people. My payroll got upside down of my revenue. Now I'm a little miserable. Because, but, but, but a good owner and a good entrepreneur, and for those of you I'm talking to, you have to see past the, the, the binge of discomfort and past the diet of misery because in between all of that is the best place you want to be, that best weight point, that best you know, human point of existing. And that's the same thing with businesses. They're going to get a little uncomfortable. They're going to get a little painful, a little uncomfortable, a little painful. But overall, they're going to constantly be on that trajectory of going yeah. where you want to go. As long as you follow and you're committed to your entrepreneurial vision and you trust, Yoni said it best, hey, I've done this before. I know what this uncomfortableness feels like. I know what this misery feels like, but I also know it's just short-lived. 
And, and Jordan, as you're embarking on it, keep looking past that. Keep ahead of your needs. Get the recruiting out there ahead of your needs. Mike Gorman has a long history. And when he speaks, he's going to tell you, ebb, flow, ebb, flow. But you have to outcreate yesterday. That's it's funny. funny. I'm just going to tie Mike into this whole conversation because he's done it all, right? And he's going to yeah. tell us a little bit about a different model. But I, I will tell you what I love about all of you guys is you are all unique and you are all different. And, you know, you're all involved in Meg Academy, but you have customization. Like you said, Yoni, like true sports and Meg, it's, it's all about supplementing what yeah. you're doing and making it work from a business standpoint. It's like, we have this healing hand that has to be really strong, but if you don't have a strong business hand, you're not going to be able to exercise that healing hand. So it becomes very important to whatever that vision is that you have, it has to make sense from a business perspective. So I would like to wrap Mike into the conversation. Oh, Yoni's got to add something here. Oh, I, was, yeah, yeah, uh, I don't know if it's a worthwhile ad, but I, I would say it's like oh. the other thing I appreciate when you talk about meeting me, like true sports, where true sports is, is um, you even see it in like that snippet of how I responded to Nicole's answer, which, which was me like, focusing on what I'm really good at, which is driving, driving business and like just making people get in that door, in that door. That's my strong suit. I was very weak on the other aspect, which is like, uh, how do I make sure I'm collecting everything and how do I get organized? It's just not where my head is. Right. And that's what you got to do. You got to fill in your weak spots. Yes. And that, you know, that's what Meg has done is like, they, they identified where is the weak, weak spot. You got to be like humble enough to understand that. And then how do you put in systems to supplement it? No, I think that's really well said. And you, you, and I know, because I know Toya, you've su surrounded yourself with strong, supportive people that make things go right. And Tim, you know, like your clinical director. So I think there's a lot of people that you've put in place that help balance everything out to, to make things go right for you. So I think that's a very worthwhile point. And for the listeners, what you just heard Nicole say is, is, is cannot be under, it just cannot be overstated. It absolutely cannot. Yoni would be the first one because we know him pretty well. He's a humble gentleman. He's very good at what he does, but he's as good as the people he surrounded himself with. And I've known Mike for a very long time. Mike will tell you the same thing. When I came out to St. Louis and met his team, he's like, oh yeah, this is my golden player here. This is my golden player there. And they afford me to be the best me. And then Jordan, I don't know. I'm sure though, you are connected to someone who you feel the same way. Because I can tell you Meg's success isn't the Brian Gallagher show by far. It is the fact that I have Nicole's and I have Matthew's, I have Denise's and Allie's and literally the list goes on. We have like 54 some employees in 16 different states. It's the talent, man. It's the talent. But guess what? That talent would reverse. I would hope I, if I wasn't here, they would be saying the same about yeah. I would hope they would be saying, I, I want to be connected to someone like you too, you know? So for those of you listening, Nicole said that just like off the cuff, it's huge that you hold the line on having the best and brightest talent surrounding you. So Mike, I would love you, Mike, to share, please share a little bit of your history that got you here, because what you're doing now is earth, you know, groundbreaking, you know, it's never been done and people are definitely want to hear about that, but bring them up your journey as to how you got there, because a lot of people are back behind you about five steps and you could bring them forward in sharing that. Thank you guys for letting me be on this Zoom cast. I feel honored to spend some time with all of you. A uh, long history. I did not graduate physical therapy school in the 2000s. I graduated <laughs> in 1993. So uh, I opened my first clinic in St. Louis in 2002. I just knew I wanted to have my own practice. I was not happy working for a big corporation. And I said, I'm just going to try it. I always thought if I, if I attempt and fail, it's better than to not attempt at all. So I did. And we grew our practice in St. Louis from one clinic to seven clinics. And on the outside, everything looked great. But on the inside, there was a lot of structural issues that we, I dealt with because I was so busy treating patients that I didn't give enough time to be a CEO. And so in 2015, I was at the private practice section conference. One of my good friends was one of a client of Brian's. She goes, hey, this guy is gonna talk. I want you to hear him talk because I think he can help you. And again, we had seven clinics, everything looked great. Um, 
but a lot of churning on the inside. So I heard Brian talk and I just knew that um, I was convinced that he was the one that could help me and his company could help me to give my company better structure. And long story short, um, we brought him on and within a year and a half, we grew 25%, which was pretty good for an established practice. But more importantly, not only did we grow 25%, we had so much, well, we probably grew 25% because we had so much better structure. You know, we had our seven division org board. We had specific roles clearly defined. There was, you know, there was no more guesswork anymore. Um, and, you know, Brian was the one that, you know, first time he came into St. Louis, because back then there was no Meg Academy. So Brian would get on the plane, come in. And the first time my executive team and I met with him, he pulled me aside on a, on the break. And he just was said the best thing to me ever. He goes, he goes, um, you know, Mike, you're in charge of a, a, a multi-million dollar company. Get out of the weeds and start being a CEO. And that totally changed everything. The next week, I went from treating 30 hours of patients to 10 hours. And all of a sudden, my company started to grow because I was enjoying it more. I was no longer enjoying it. What I wasn't enjoying was the reimbursement that we suffer from, like many other cities uh, we suffer from in St. Louis, Missouri. And I tried everything I could from lobbying under state capital to talking to all the insurance companies and it wasn't budging. And so I looked to sell our practice. And in 2017, I sold uh, to a major corporation. Hey, Mike, and can I just interrupt you right there? I think yes. the audience would love to know what was that reimbursement because it's relative to how terrible it can be in the country and how good it could be for others. Can you share what that was? Yeah, we were about $72 a visit. On average for seven clinics, multiply that out by visits. I can tell you Yoni would be slitting his wrists if that was his number right now. I can guarantee you that to me, and I just want to emphasize, that to me makes me want to stick a pen in my neck and hope I die a slow, miserable death because a freaking massage therapist makes more money than that. For, yeah. for a 12 month certificate, you know, a, an online personal fitness trainer can make more money than that. These are DPTs. So Mike's story moving forward, this is a very, very relevant milestone and cognition that he had when he said, this environment is not treating us fairly. And then what happened after that? So after I, I sold my, my practice, I worked for the corporation I did for about two and a half years. And I quickly found out I'm a much, much better employer than an employee. Um, I wasn't meant to work for a corporation. So I left after two and a half years. Um, but one thing was I have, when you sell a practice, you have a non-compete. And mine was for five years from day to sale. But yeah. I could not do any outpatient in the St. Louis area. Um, and I didn't want to go over to Illinois and open an outpatient clinic. I, I didn't want to drive 30 miles. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I had to think about things. So I left there. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I know I couldn't do that. I could not do that for one more week. So I left and for about two months, I tried a telehealth. I opened a telehealth practice and I became, um, because of the PT compact, I became a a uh, telehealth provider in like 20 states. And I had, because I, again, I couldn't do outpatient. Uh, so I was like, well, this makes sense. Pandemic had just started. It makes a lot of sense. Well, I tell you, trying to do a solely telehealth practice is very, very tough. I think it's a beautiful adjunct, but it's very, very tough. And, you know, I have uh, bills like everyone else. So I know I couldn't do that. So my very intelligent wife, and I'm I always plug her, but she's sitting back behind me. I want her to hear this because she doesn't hear me say this enough. She goes, Mike, why don't you start a mobile practice where you treat patients in their home? Because my, my particular non-compete did have a home care exclusion. So I could do home health. I could treat in the home and it was legal. I knew I wouldn't, they wouldn't bother me. Mike, is your so, wife uh, is your wife available for hire? Do you know if she's looking at all? Actually, she's uh, coming with me to the uh, private practice section conference, so you'll get to meet her again because you've already okay. met her. 
So uh, Matthew, mark down her name for recruitment potential. <laughs> yeah. Well, she's got her own company, so I'm not sure she can work for you. That but, doesn't um, stop us, Mike. That doesn't. That doesn't. I'm not. That, that doesn't you deter can me one bit. Her, her salary, then maybe, and have her work. Her salary. <laughs> you know what we'll, I pay we'll Nicole, anyway, Mike? If you knew what I, I paid, Nicole, uh, I would not be worried about. It's like a volunteer job. And <laughs> so Sharon said, "Why don't you do that? You know, a lot of people in this town." You know, and, and truth be told, Sharon has her own geriatric uh, home care company, geriatric care management company. Yeah. But um, she goes, you know, I can probably get a few folks to you, but you know enough people. And June 2020, I uh, morphed it in. I moved telept into I moved PT, and it was just me. And um, I'm like, well, okay. So I figure out. I can't do this on the private insurance contracts in St. Louis. I can't drive around, treat a patient for an hour, make $72 a visit. And so we quickly decided that we would become a Medicare Part B provider only and everything else would be self-pay. And some people said, oh, Mike, that won't work. As soon as people start to get on about that won't work. Some very smart man that I really respect said, uh, you won't, it's very hard to have more than three full-time PTs, which I really re respect that person. But um, that drove me because once someone tells me something I that can't. I don't want to hear, I go past that. <laughs> and we started growing. And about after uh, four or five months, I have hired a part-time PT, which uh, I would recommend anyone that has a mobile practice or perhaps an outpatient practice, you're much better off um, uh, accepting uh, maybe a loss for a short period of time and hire, hiring someone full-time. Hard, hard to grow a practice with someone with part-time. But anyway, so we kept growing and um, hired my first full-time PT, not until June of 2021. And so so Mike, of, Mike, for today, those today listening... Mike, I'm sorry to interrupt, but for those listening, that's a very common, common error that people make. And where, where, what I diagnose about that area, for those of you listening, it's just like you're Jordan, right? And you're starting up and all of a sudden you start ramping up. And once you get to about 45, 50, 55 visits a week, depending on how you're doing your schedule, right? You're over 85% efficiency. And so the risk adverse, the conservative nature that you have is going to tell your brain, hire just what I need. Just, just go in with that part-timer, right? This is where I'm talking about. You're sitting at the table and you got to get uncomfortable. You got to eat a little too much turkey and get a little uncomfortable. Hire that full-timer. Know that you're paying more than they're producing, but it's just going to be a short-lived period of time. Mike said that very cavalier, but that is a very big bullet of wisdom right there. Go for the full timer. And you know what we say in Meg Academy? That increases your necessity level. That increases the pressure on you as the owner to get that guy, get that gal full. Dump your patience. Eval and pass. Eval and pass. So, Mike, that is such, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I wanted to make sure that the people listening understand that here at Meg, we see that as a stumbling block all the time. And we're like, go big or go home. Hire that person. Be willing to use your line of credit if you have to. I don't care. But it's going to increase your necessity level to fill them. And that's what Mike was sharing with you. And I think, Yoni, you would agree with that as well, correct? Yeah. With the, I mean, we're, you know, we're 40. We have one part-timer. Yeah. 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 And I think Mike said another great thing that's a little nugget of advice is like he shed his clinician hat pretty early on. I, I would imagine, right, Mike, would you say that you were able to shed that so that you can focus on the CEO, you know, an executive hat. So I think that's another, you know, word of advice. And, and Jordan, you are, you know, new to the game, but that is a really wise nugget to, to kind of take in. And as you scale within your practice, making sure you're able to delegate is going to be a huge deal because it's going to stop you up. If you're tied up doing the clinic, clinical work, you know, right. all day, every day, you're not going to have time to focus on how to grow and expand. And, and Yoni, you mentioned in, in putting like the systems in place. 
I want to talk a little bit about that because I know you have a lot of different systems that have been your go-to. Can you share with our public on, you know, what some of the pivotal systems have been that have, have really allowed you to grow and expand? Yeah. Um, I mean, to, to, I, I think to get to uh, call it more, I'd say more than three, like I need, I needed people to not just manage what I start, but to be incentivized and to have a structure around looking out to start almost like their own. And like, it's like this idea of like an entrepreneur where I'm able to create a structure that they can grow within the company. And they're, they're able to take some risk off the table because they're still with true sports, but also have some of that upside and be incentivized to find their own having that mindset that that kind of framework and, and structure to your point has allowed us to multiply quickly so even even um like jordan if you're thinking about like you're one and a half two therapists now and, and you're new but if you're going to have another clinic maybe start thinking about that like mm -hmm. um how do i keep these people and, and to the original point um that you know that Brian was talking about previously is surround yourself with good talent. Well, how do you have a structure where you can surround yourself with good talent and keep and retain that talent? That's a structure question. It's it's a it's a mindset, it's a personality, but it's also a structure. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's a big piece as an example. Yeah, Listen. and I think a good piece of advice for like those high performers, like you know those think outside the box type of employees is you really have to check in on them on a regular basis because it's important to know what their professional goals are and making sure that's still alignment with like, you know, a true sports or, you know, whatever your company is, um, you know, because they are going to evolve and change too. And you just want to make sure you're not giving them opportunity to go seek elsewhere if their personal and professional goals aren't being met. That's right. And Yoni hit the nail on the head when he used the word entrepreneur. And one of my favorite systems for that, that I've seen work better than most, which is I, what I embrace in my own company is a net revenue profit sharing system, a net revenue profit sharing, because they're not there. It's not fair for them to absorb the risks of all the gross of all the income and expenses. But if they're focusing on generating more net, whether it be a part of your business or entire business, now they're really effectively like a partner in the business without all the risk and pressure. So why wouldn't they want it? Like they're, they're never going to get something better than that out in the outside world. It just doesn't exist. Right. So I'm a big fan of that. Not to be like all like one way is the only way, but of all of what I've seen, I've seen that work the absolute best for those of you listening. Yeah. I want to circle back to Mike Gordon. He was just rolling on a wonderful story and let's hear how he expanded from where he was. Before we do that, real quick, we have a question from Don and okay. it's for Yoni. Um, do you have an example of an employee who was being an entrepreneur? I have four or five examples. Like I, I think that's how, that's how you get to 11 um, clinics or, or, or whatever, whatever your goal is. Right. Like, um, and what's awesome is they keep cropping up. I, I like just having lanes and, and roles to say, if you're a clinic director, awesome. Here's what that looks like. If you're, if you're entrepreneur, awesome. Here's what that looks like. We still need people treating. Yes. If that's you, awesome. awesome. Here's how you do that. Yes. But, but, to, but you got to check in and say, where do you feel like you are? And, and be flexible enough to say, I thought I was this and now I'm this. Okay. How, yeah. how do we do that? And I think what the question was saying is like, what, what do we mean by entrepreneur? Brian, oh, sorry. Can define because it's not just someone who goes in and clocks in and clocks out, does the job. It's, would you, would you say it's someone who can think outside of the box who can, you know, kind of it's think. Not, it's not, it's not only that it's someone who takes a look, look, when you're dating and you're single, you could be a responsible person. You're responsible for yourself. You brush your teeth, you go to bed at night, you sleep well, you drink water, you exercise, right? But when you get married, you can't just live in a married life being just responsible for you. You now have to be accountable to mm -hmm. your spouse. And when you have children, you have now have to be accountable. To them. My kid throws a baseball through a window. He or she ain't paying for it. I am paying for it. So when we look at that entrepreneur, it's that person who comes to work and just isn't like, I'm responsible for my patients, my patient outcomes and my schedule. It's a person that looks at the overall business and the environment and the practice and says, 
I feel accountable for how this looks. I feel accountable for what our brand says to people in the community. I feel accountable for the coworker next to me whistling and singing along with the music overhead versus the person who doesn't talk to anyone. Like how can I from some way contribute to making things better internally, better for my patients and better for my representation of my brand and my community. To me, that's my definition of an entrepreneur. They take accountability for the bigger sphere, not just responsibility for oneself. Would, would you would you agree with that, Mike and, and Yoni? I, I know you both have had that and Jordan as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think it's well, well said, but yeah, please weigh in guys. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, and nothing to add. You no, just. No, I, are... I think they. I think they all head nodded. Like, yeah, I agree. With that. <laughs> I would. I. I. I, 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 I one hundred. I think it's also important. Like, Jordan, I still, go ahead. Oh, I still remember very clearly what it was like to create revenue for someone else, right. and and see nothing because of it. And I. I just don't want that on my team because I remember what that does, mm-hmm. um, and so they should be rewarded for it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And your retention is good, right, Yoni? I mean, you're you're not seeing a revolving door. We're not. Yeah, that's awesome. Gordon, what were you going to say? How you lead? So, uh, my company is called Kansas Physical Therapy Partners, and and that responsibility for one another concept that you were just mentioning, Brian. That's the the internal partnership that I imagine when when I think of how I want my clinic to be run and my staff to feel towards one another. Uh, Another part of it is partnering with other providers and and patients to optimize care. But internally, we're partners with one another to build one another up to improve our brand so that when people think about physical therapy in our area, there's no question what clinic they're thinking about. Yeah. And, and it's because of that internal structure uh, and, and that, that partnership or that entrepreneurship that you're talking about. That's, very that's awesome. very much, I mean, you just yeah. spoke volumes to me. Uh-huh. That's exactly what I had envisioned when I thought very about awesome. it. And it creates a, the company culture that people yeah. want to be a part of. And in this day and age, when it's so difficult to find good help, you absolutely need to put that foot forward to, yeah, to create absolutely. that company culture that people you know, want to be on the same mission, you know, to, right. to see the same vision. And so I think. Yeah, absolutely. You know, well said, everybody. And we're going to turn this back to Mike. I will give you guys this one last tidbit of, of a nugget of, of experience and, and hopefully success. In spite of all of that, as you build that up, please keep this vision in your head. You and you alone are still the chef in that kitchen. And everybody else is a sous sous chef, right? The secondary sous cook. I can't stress that enough. You can be Kansas City Partners, and I know Jordan's got it set up correctly, but at the end of the day, Jordan says yes or no. There's still one final hammer that makes the final day. This is not a democracy. No business, no business anywhere in the world has ever succeeded as a voting democracy because you'll get group think and just turn on the news and you'll see it all over right now. So I do want to say this, bring on as many people, profit share them, net profit share them, reward them. But at the end of the day, my staff knows I will call the vinyl call on whether we're going to do A or B or go forward or backward or sideways. And they have to be okay with that because somebody has to make that final decision. Don't ever give up that baton of final decision making. You are the final chef. Everybody else is a sous cook in the kitchen, which is fabulous. Surround yourself with a bunch of sous chefs, believe me. But anyways, so Mike, let's pick that up. I hope that was helpful. Pick pick up right from there. Yeah, so the only thing I would I would add so far, as far as giving everyone one tip, the one thing that I look back on my early private practice career when I started building my clinic and clinics went from one to two, two to three, the first five or six, seven years, probably I thought that every one of my employees should be just like me as far as how they acted, how they cared, um, working extra. And that is not the reality. You will have people that care and most do. And if you don't have turnover, that's a good sign that people care about your company, but do not expect that employee to be an owner because they they wanted to be an owner. They would be an owner already and they would open their own practice. I think it's important to value people for who they are 
And if you think they're going to be an owner, you're going to be let down each and every day. And probably for the first five, five years of my practice, I had a lot of staff turnover and I couldn't figure out why. And it's because I was putting undue pressure on them and me. Once I knocked that off, things got a lot better. Yeah. And I think that's very well said. And it kind of um, circles back to what Yoni said earlier, where you need staff workers. You don't need everyone to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. You don't need everyone to be a clinical director. You need people who do good work. And if you try and put them in a different lane that they're not, you know, either prepared for or just not the right personality fit, yeah. you're going to be, it's going to be met with resistance. And it's, I think not you, have, you have to find out what, you have to find out what, what each and every employee wants. Yes. Even though they're a staff PT, that doesn't mean they want to shoot a YouTube video. They may hate that. They may love that. It doesn't mean they oh. want to uh, market. Do you want to dress up in your... <laughs> so, I mean, anyway. Okay, so go ahead. Uh, uh, back, to, back to my story. So we have uh, had a mobile practice now for a little over a year and a half. Uh, we have nine th therapists, six are full-time, three, including me, are part-time treating. Um, we now are treating not only in St. Louis, but into Illinois as well. And all this is really without me being able to market tremendously in the St. Louis area. The, the biggest thing is has been educating providers, um, referring providers about we are not a home health care company. Oh, we're Medicare Part B, and with Part B, you can treat people in their home, in an office, on the playing field, wherever you want to treat them. You don't have to be, um, we're not Part A, so we're not con confined to, we can only treat them at home if they're homebound. So we've definitely had to educate providers in the area about what we do. Um, and I will tell you, I have nothing against the outpatient world because I lived that world for 20 some odd years. I loved it, but my non-compete is up in October and I have no plans to open an outpatient clinic again because <laughs> this model, um, it's I love this model. I'm, we are giving, well, me when I treat, which is about 10, 12 patients a week, hours a week, it's the best care personally that I've ever able to provide and my stress level has yeah I still have stress but it's decreased so much because I'm no longer in the clinic having to keep track of multiple things at one time and I, I don't know for me this is this has been the best model that I've found for myself for my staff for every patient yes we're very selective about what insurances we accept we have to be um, and I love the outpatient world, but I'm, I, uh, I'm not going to be, be going back to that. In fact, I want this model for as many therapists as we can. In January, we became a franchise. Yes. So the idea that's kicking around in my head as a therapist watching this is to say, okay, Mike, and it comes back to what I shared with you before, um, how are you meeting the challenge of collecting part B reimbursement? And maybe it's because you're doing a fair amount of cash. I don't know what your answer is going to be, but how are you meeting the challenge of taking outpatient rates? But I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong too, I could be wrong on this, but you're incurring home health like expenses because these therapists are not getting paid clinic. Sure. So how are you, what is your, what is your payroll as a percent of GI or how are you actually balancing that? How are you making that work? Well, we shoot for a payrolls percent of GI to be 60%. That's, That's what our goal is. Excellent. I'm going to tell you, it typically is a bit higher, but then for me in this model, it's okay if it's a little higher because I don't have rent. There's yep. a lot of other expenses that myself now as an owner do not incur. So if my payroll per, percent of GI goes up to 70%, I don't love it. Mm -hmm. but I yep. can cope with it a lot better than when I saw that creep up in the, in the outpatient setting. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So are you offsetting that with uh, what, well, what percent of, would you say of your weekly caseload, not just yours, but the entire is cash people paying cash for the in-home services versus Medicare? Well, I am a 
Meg client and I have been a Meg coach and still am. If they have me, I don't know if they'll have uh, me. Oh, they're always but, but, to Nicole. <laughs> so I strive for we strive for 20%. Oh, good. Um, to be cash. And good. honestly, that number is increasing because the more patients we treat, the more that experience this model, the more yeah. they tell their friends and family. And I never uh I never think that the cost is too much. You can't, you can't put someone's financial condition, you can't own that. You don't yeah. know what they're willing to pay. You do not know that. And I make sure my staff understands that. Yeah, I could not agree with you more. I hear people shy away. Oh, 150 an eval and $100 a revisit. Or, you know, I've got practice owners in the country that are getting 250 an eval and 180 a revisit. And people are like, what? And I'm like, well, what is the patient experience? What is the outcome that's happening? What is the community? Would you say, Mike, um, now the, the person who said, you know, I've not seen a mobile PT practice encompass more than four full-time PTs and succeed in, in, in my experience is because they're in one local market. Would you say Mike, the re, in part, the reason why you've been able to break out of that, that, that um, stigma of four or less PTs in a mobile PT practice is possibly because you branched out into other markets rather than just your backyard. Do you think that was an integral successful action for you to grow to the size you are? Yeah. I mean, for sure. You need a certain amount of population because you have to keep in mind that 80% of what, well, yeah, about 80% of what we treat is age 65 and up, but you have to be aware as I know everyone's on this call, if you have met or if you're of Medicare age, it doesn't mean you have Medicare. Yeah. Uh, almost half of the patients or half of the people that are 65 and up and now have a Medicare Advantage plan. We don't get involved with that. Yeah. So you do, yeah, yeah you do need enough population. And for us going into the Illinois market, and doing what we've done has been helpful. But I would say the number one thing for all of us is to have structure within your company, to appropriately onboard and train staff, have trust in them after you onboard and train them, stay in touch with them, but let them breathe, let them grow. And I will never have a show, I won't say never, but I should never have a shortage of therapists because in St. Louis, as I'm sure a lot of cities, most of the outpatient therapists have to work for corporations where you see a lot of patients in a day and they're all tired of it. And the best thing about, I think, is what we're doing is that we're giving therapists that were looking to become, let's see, real estate agents, medical sales, they were this close to going into that. And we were, I was able to meet them. They came on board and their love for their career has been reinvigorated because they now have time to spend with each patient. Yeah. And wouldn't you say, and I'll, I'll just say two other things. Yes. Going into other markets has given you an additional access to more population. And that, that, that is an answer. I was kind of leaning when I asked that question to going into other markets, did it not also avail you to higher reimbursement rates outside of the market you're in? Cause you went into Illinois, possibly are you getting a little bit more per visit? Number one. And number two, another successful action that I think you touched on in the mobile PT is it's very easy to hire the right people and make them entrepreneurs because you've taken all the nonsense off of their plate. And you said, look, just go ahead, schedule your own patients. You're in charge of your own schedule. You're in charge of your own volume. You're in charge of your efficiency. I'm going to make it extremely highly structured, uh, good systems and great training so that you can just be the best practitioner. You've got people more in love with being a practitioner again, without all the nonsense. I, I think that's, I think those are my two big hits. Would you, would you agree with that? The expanding into another area and maybe having a higher reimbursement, uh, well, it hasn't affected us yet because um, the Illinois side we're in, it's not, not the, the Chicago rate. So it's still pretty much St. Louis private insurance rate. So we still do Medicare Part B, only we're adding in TRICARE, which will help. But um, there may be some areas that we go into in the U.S. where Maybe taking the private insurance is worth it, but there's not going to be many. There's there, there's a few I can think of, but if we ever go into that area, yeah, we could 
do that, but um, I don't know. There's no. it's well in your franchise, Mike. So like, I know some really high reimbursed part Rockville, Maryland, Silver Spring, going down to Fairfax, going to Cook County, uh, Illinois, going over to, you know, Spokane, uh, Portland, uh, you know, Seattle, those markets, you know, 129 a visit, you know, Boise, 115 a visit, you know, Twin Falls, 120 a visit, 118 a visit. I mean, that's a whole game changer, right? Instead of Jersey, that's 71 a visit, or worse yet, Rochester, Buffalo, New York, which is like $58 a visit. So when you're looking mobile PT, like $58 a visit, like literally like I'll be a bartender, right? I'll, I'll join Nicole with her previous profession of being a bartender. I don't know what else you were doing in the bar, but she was doing something there. But, um, you know, there are much better markets that is if, if you're a mobile PT franchise or if you're somebody watching this and you're looking to open up and you're sitting in the Carolinas, Alabama, Arkansas, Texas, even Florida, Florida's 88 to 92 a visit, depending on where you are in Florida, low markets are 85, but the national average is $83 a visit. So if you're watching this and you're in a marketplace where you, and if you don't know what your average reimbursement is, just go to the APTA website and pick up you know, the, the Medicare calculator, put in four or five of your most typical treatment sessions and see what you're getting paid by Medicare. It's going to give you a very good shot of what you're going to make in that area if you're looking to open up a bricks and mortar or even if you're looking to do mobile PT. It's definitely going to tell you what you're after. So Mike, would you agree with that? Like there are some real, even California, California is wild. If you're in Northern California, it's 110, 115. If you're in Southern California, it's like 78 to 81. So wait, five minutes on. I would cut you off because I want to answer these questions. So what do you, so with from Don, Donald, what do you charge for cash pay and what is the number of visits per day for full-time PT? Everybody answer that one, like quick, yeah. quick, quick. Um, so I'll, I'll go first. Uh, oh, Mike. We um, look for 30 visits a week is full-time. That's our expectation. So whatever, six a day. Cash pay, we do $150 per visit. Each visit is an hour and we just last month starting offer, uh, offering a three package, three visit package rate that has been wildly successful. Good. Yoni? Three visit package rate is a reduction to what? Like $100 a visit? 125 a visit. 125. So from 150 per visit to 125 for a package of three. There you go. Yoni? Uh, we work on a value point system, which I heard is effective. So we look yes. at uh, 55 value points is full. Um, it equates to about 10 patients a day. We schedule on the 45 minute um, and we, it's a 120 for evals, a hundred bucks for follow-ups. Good. And Yoni's in Maryland. Yep. And Jordan. So we do very little cash pay, uh, but we've settled on a hundred dollars for an eval and $80 for a, a follow-up. Um, and we're doing one-on-one -on -one for an hour. So you know, we're, we're targeting 40 for full-time. Where are you, Jordan? In central Kansas, Salina, Kansas. Okay. So, you know, depending on your county and your median income, I, that sounds low. So I, I would, yeah. I would definitely say at least 125 and at least a hundred, okay. mm -hmm. I would say you're undervaluing yourself and because you're doing so little, you have nothing to lose, right? Put it out there charge more for what you do, especially listening to what, how you're practicing and in the high yeah. caliber people you're employing. Mm -hmm. I think you're undervaluing yourself. I would probably even go 130 to 100. I think you need more of a spread between the eval and revisit. So that's okay. my advice. The perspective is, is they're not paying for that hour of time, right? They're, they're paying for your experience, your innovation, your, Good you know, your, you, know it, it, you can't, yeah. It's the whole exchange thing. Because it's not time for money. It's not, not money for time. It's the, it's the outcome. It's the, it's the, it's the product. And look, mm -hmm. they're not going to get that from some new grad down the street working at Benchmark. Or did I just say that? Um, <laughs> some other franchise company. <laughs> yeah. So I want to sign off because we only have a couple minutes left. Wait, wait, wait. Were there more questions? That was a good question. What? No. You're being lazy. Ask some questions. I had to cut you off somehow because I get you to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to end because we only have a couple minutes left here with your final piece of advice. Like we said, we kind of promoted you guys, you guys are our kind of gold star clients right now. So if you can leave our audience with one word of advice, I would love to hear from you all. 
Go ahead, Jordan. Why don't you start us off? Well, for for someone who's considering starting up, I would say absolutely don't hesitate to do it. Uh, and and I personally feel like the best investment that I've made in this whole process was joining Meg. And they've not paid me extra for doing Yay. saying that at all. Though I would welcome some if they wanted to. Uh, but a hundred percent, the the mentors that I needed to get myself comfortable with operating a clinic and, and knowing what the direction needed to be to get to where I, I want to go, 100% that's come from Meg. So uh, that would be, I would say pull the trigger and definitely consider joining Meg or someone like that. We appreciate that. Thank you, Absolutely. Jordan. And I see you very active in our mastermind community. I love that because both as asking questions and providing insights to people, that's, we're all a community. We're all in this together. You know, that's the way I see it. And we can all learn from each other. So I, you know, appreciate that part too. Absolutely. Uh, Yoni. Um, I, I'd say you got to figure out your passion. Identify your passion. If it's CEO slash PT, do it. If, if this business stuff worries you, this ain't for you. Um, it's just a matter of passion. And then I would echo what we talked about before, which is, do a real self-assessment, which, and if you're figure out what you're not good at and find those who are. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Okay. Mike. Well, I'm still waiting for my check in the mail too, just like Jordan. So I know it's coming. I know it's coming, but uh, hold your breath. I would say Meg. Yes. Meg has been so crucial to the last seven years. I wish I would have had that in them from day one, but my advice is to spend the time developing, onboarding, training, train your staff well, and then let them breathe and measure by statistics. Look at it every week, every month. And that's how you know whether they're doing a good job and don't manage by emotion. Yeah, I like it. Brian, 30 seconds or less. You are so bad to me. My advice is twofold and it doesn't center on myself. And I don't think it should center on yourself either. My advice is it stems from an experience I had in 2003 when my two clinics and my staffing company of 55 contracts and a hundred and some employees was in the tank and I was losing money every month. And I literally put my head in my hands. I remember the day. And I said to myself, like, literally, I think I even verbalized it out loud to myself. I was completely alone. And I said, I would pay anybody, anything, if they could just come in here and show me what I'm doing wrong and show me what I need to do right. I'm a smart person. I'm a good learner. I'm a good duplicator. I will do, but where do I go? Like, how do I make that happen? So I was at that younger age looking external to myself, to my own knowledge and experience for help to be a better owner and a better executive and a better professional. That humbleness, that degree of self-reflection is my bit of very, very strong advice for your success. And my second tip for professional success in, in, in business and in practice is on, similar to Yoni, only embark upon building a community, which is what it is to have a mobile PT practice, a cash-based practice, a hybrid practice, a bricks and mortar practice. If you're going to embark upon being an owner of something, then you're going to be leading a community of people forward on your vision only do that if you truly love people and you can trust in bringing the best and brightest people connected to you and get out of the way. Like literally lead the show, but allow others their degree of autonomy because together you can create some of the best things. But if you're going to be that know-it-all owner, good luck. If you're going to be that innocent owner where it's all, you know, all of good luck. It's, it's, it's that middle of the ground that, that, you know, very interested go getter owner that makes it successful because you embrace those around you. Those are my two dip tips for professional success. Yeah. And my little parting advice is to, to be able to pivot and, and be nimble. And, you know, like Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. So you have to, you have to be able to adapt. And Mike, I think you illustrated that really well when you went, 
the telehealth route and it's like, oh, okay, we have to kind of, you know, take a little turn here and let's go mobile. And, yeah. you know, being somebody, when you decide to move forward with opening your own practice, you are investing in yourself and you're not going to let yourself down. You're going to figure it out. So you can't fail. And that's why we like to say we've never had a startup fail. And it's because we know that the people that we, that align with us are, are truly investing in themselves. So um, that's kind of my parting advice. I want to thank each and every one of you. You guys provided such invaluable information. And I so appreciate having you in our community. Um, you make us better. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Bye, guys. Bye. All right. Take care. Have Bye. a great day.